Live. Happy Friday, I'm Kaui Lucas. We are here at Hawaii is my mainland in the ThinkTech studios, downtown beautiful Honolulu. With me this week, uh, my guest is Paul Achitoff, who is the managing director of Earth Justice's Mid-Pacific office here in Honolulu. Paul, thank you. Thanks for having me, Kaui. Um, I was so grateful uh, that you were able to come down and talk this week because something kind of big has happened, in, in my opinion, um, this week. On Wednesday, um, the Kauai Board of Water Supply um, nominate, approved the nomination of Beth Tokioka. And Beth Tokioka is the, um, uh, her day job is for Syngenta. And that seems like that might be an awkward mix for some people. The blogs have been going off on this. And um, so I wanted you, because you're very involved at, uh, at, at Earth Justice with all these issues around um, atrazine and pesticide spraying. So can you give a little background of, of what you, as the managing uh, director of Earth Justice, has been doing around these issues? Sure. Well, Earth Justice has been working on issues relating to pesticides for a long time, and, and, and I've been working on issues concerning uh, genetic engineering in Hawaii and elsewhere for uh, quite a few years. And you know, most recently, I've been working on issues, uh, for example, defending the ordinances that some of the counties passed to try and get better regulation of pesticides and genetically engineered products. Um, so when I heard about uh, this appointment to the board on Kauai, uh, it certainly caught my eye because Syngenta is a big player on Kauai and uh, Beth has, has been for a while the uh, doing the communications uh, for Syngenta I mean, she's essentially doing public relations. Um, and she's going to continue to do that. And, and now she's going to be on uh, a board that is responsible for uh, the overseeing the operations of uh, the agency that regulates drinking water on Kauai. And considering that Syngenta is the inventor and primary manufacturer worldwide of, oh, of atrazine, among many other pesticides. Uh, and atrazine has been responsible for groundwater contamination in countless places, uh, including in Hawaii. Uh, and including on and, Kauai. And including on Kauai. Uh, it's remarkable to me. I mean, to me, it shows very poor judgment to be putting someone in that position that I think uh, begs for you know, conflict of interest claims uh, when, you know, with all due respect to Ms. Tokioka, who I don't know personally and I don't have anything against her personally, I can't imagine that she is the most qualified person to be in this position at this time, uh, given the combination of her background or lack thereof and her day job uh, as the the public relations person for Syngenta which certainly uh, potentially could be involved in issues about of groundwater contamination it simply doesn't make any sense it, to me it has been actually yeah well it's can true. you talk about that well there are many many uh, water boards similar to the one uh, on Kauai that around the United States that have had problems with groundwater contamination from atrazine. At atrazine is an herbicide. It's the second most uh, commonly used herbicide in the country after glyphosate. Um, you know, American growers use 70 or 80 million pounds of it a year. And uh, it's an endocrine disruptor, meaning that, for example, it can turn male frogs into females, and it has, uh, it's associated with a variety of uh, health issues in people as well, uh, ranging from developmental problems, hormonal problems, 
uh, reproductive problems and even potentially cancer such as thyroid cancer. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a toxic chemical. Uh, and it, it, it has a high potential for groundwater contamination. In well, fact, why is that? Well, it's just the nature of the chemical, the fact that it's widely used when it's put on to fields um, and rainfall will, will bring it down into the water table. And, you know, some chemicals have a greater or lesser uh, likelihood of going quickly through soil or running off into streams and so forth. Atrazine seems to be susceptible to that. That's uh, the primary reason why it's banned in uh, the European Union, for example. Uh, ironically, Syngenta is a Swiss-based corporation, so in its home country, atrazine is, is banned. But here, it's very widely used. Uh, a few years ago, um, a, a lot of these uh, water boards found themselves having to pay a lot of money to filter atrazine out of their water supply. Um, and so they sued Syngenta to reimburse those, those costs. There was a class action and Syngenta agreed to pay over $100 million to settle it. And uh, Kauai was one of those that was uh, asked whether it wanted to join into this suit and uh, share in the proceeds of this settlement. And that went before the very board that Ms. Tokioka is now on. Uh, and they approved wow. it. They approved it and uh, the county got uh, a few thousand dollars out of this fund. So it raises a question naturally of, well, now that she's on the board and she has a, a obligation to protect the interests of Syngenta, her employer, how would she uh, vote on issues that relate to Syngenta? Uh, you know, she might say, well, you know, I, I wouldn't do anything that's unethical. If there's a conflict, I'll consult with people. I'll find out if there's a, con a, a conflict and I will recuse myself. Well, that, you know, that may or may not work. And I think at a bare minimum, what it does is it raises in the mind of the public uh, legitimate questions about how trustworthy the officials are who are responsible for the safety of their drinking water. And people shouldn't have to wonder about that. That's for sure. I mean, I just think just on that level, on that very human level, can I trust the water I'm drinking there? I, I, I'm, I read a, a little bit around uh, Beth, and she seems to be a very smart woman. She has a great background in, um, in county government. She was the mayor's assistant for years. She's very familiar with how things run there. But um, I, I would not feel comfortable um, with, some, with somebody who is, who's that beholding to a chemical company that can affect my drinking water. And surely there are other people that's who the are point. qualified. Right. Uh, that's the message that I think is really strange. Yeah, to me it's not so much uh, about uh, Beth herself. Uh, the question is the judgment of, uh, of, the the, of, of the nomination and the approval of the nomination. Only, uh, one, only one dissenting vote. Gary right. Hoosier was the only one, although uh, Joanne Yukimura said she had grave concerns she said she was, and did, in fact, vote for her. So there's right. only one. Right, and, and it's, it's impossible not to consider the fact that we have elections coming up in the fall and that on uh, Kauai, it's, this is a, a whole question of the agrochemical companies on the one hand and people who are concerned about the effects of their operations on the other. It's a very polarized community uh, and the, there, there are definitely competing efforts to elect people to the county council who have different views on these subjects. And so it's hard not to assume that the county council is thinking about this when they're voting on somebody who has a very clear allegiance to one side of this issue. And I think it's very unfortunate because you're, you're sort of playing politics with public health. And you know, you look at the board and there are only there are three ex officio members that are on the board because of their other jobs and then there are four at large members you have a banker you have an attorney uh you have someone who's active in the farm bureau who's already uh in that sense representing the interests of big ag in hawaii sure. and then 
you, you, you don't bring in someone who's a hydrologist, someone who is a conservationist, someone who with public health expertise, you bring in the spokesperson for Syngenta to fill that fourth position. To me, that, that really shows questionable judgment. And this isn't actually the only issue uh, with Kauai County um, that you are, and Syngenta that you're dealing with. You have recently been arguing in front of the Ninth Circuit Court. On a well, Syngenta, well, as people, most people know, uh, a few years ago, in, in order to try and get a better handle and, and greater uh, regulation of the pesticides that are being heavily used on Kauai, the County Council passed an ordinance uh, at the time known as Ordinance 2491 that required things like buffer zones uh, around sensitive areas, uh, notification of the public for pesticide spraying, uh, notification after the fact of where genetically engineered crops had been grown to provide the public with some greater security. Um, and that was passed by the County Council, but then uh, Syngenta, along with the other agrochemical companies who have the uh, genetic engineering operations on uh, Kauai, sued to set it aside, which they won in the lower court, and that's been appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which heard oral arguments on the appeal just a few weeks ago, and we're waiting to hear the outcome of whether, in fact, that ordinance uh, is or is not uh, preempted, meaning whether or not it actually um, is lawful or whether it conflicts uh, with state or federal law. So that's up in the air right now. Can you talk a little bit about those arguments with that, uh, in a way that they would be understood by the layperson? Sure. I, I, the argument is, is a fairly s straightforward one. Uh, it's a question of how much authority the county has as opposed to the state or the federal government. Um, if the federal government decides that it wants to be the only government level of government that can regulate an issue, then it can do that. It, it can say only the federal government can regulate immigration. We don't want to have every state making up its own immigration laws. By the same token, if a state says, we want to be the only state that regulates pesticides, I mean the only uh, entity within our state that regulates pesticides. We don't want the, every county having a different pesticide law. It can do that. And so the question is, is that the fact? It, it did in fact the federal government or the state government carve out pesticide regulation or genetic engineering regulation to be the exclusive within the exclusive authority of the federal or the state government and not leave anything for the county. Well, on that note, we are going to go take a little break and come back and see how that relates to Hawaii, which is our mainland. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu and I am the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and we are live with you every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. And our show focuses on Hawaii's local food uh, community. We feature not only the farmers that are producing our food, but we also feature the supporters and other folks involved in the community that are trying to promote local agriculture. <coughs> Aloha! This is Rez McJackal. The University of Hawaii football team under Rolovich is going to get wet this season. In case you didn't understand me, University of Hawaii football team is going to kick butt under Rolovich this season. So be sure to follow us on Think Tech Hawaii and Hibachi Top. I'll be at every game. And remember, aloha! York if you want. Um. Aloha, I'm Kali Lucas, and this is Hawaii is my mainland. Today I have the attorney, Paul Achitoff, who is the managing director of the Mid-Pacific Office of Earth Justice here. Paul, thanks. Thanks for My coming pleasure. and getting into this this issue that is so so difficult because it's very complex in a technical way, the whole chemical thing, and and in a political way, 
and it has this way of getting people up in arms and very emotional. Um, you know, when we go to the oh, that that um, or county ordinance that you were talking about, I remember when it passed. Oh my gosh, it was. I mean, it was the biggest news uh, anywhere, and. Um, uh, on social media and everything, it was like there was th th there was no other news that day, mm -hmm. um, and but when you have an uh, emotional issue that is really very scientific and technical, sometimes it gets lost in the in in the translation, and I've I've seen a little bit of the 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 discounting the the science because there's emotion tied to it. And I really appreciate you, you coming in and uh, presenting it in, in, in more um, understandable ways. Yeah, you know, you, you raise a good point about this, the science aspect of this. And I find it very interesting. And I have uh, some science background. Uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm an attorney. But um, I know how to read scientific journals and I've read hundreds of them. Uh, with respect to the issues that are relevant to the cases that I do. I studied science in college and high school and so forth. So I'm science literate, but on issues relating to, say, genetic engineering and pesticides, what I find is that you have a lot of people who will discount what anybody has to say uh, on the basis of, you don't know the science. The science says it's all safe. So you have somebody who purports to be speaking on behalf of science, exactly what that is, you know, we could spend all day talking about. <laughs> yes. But it's sort of like the Trump card where people say, your views don't matter because the science is on our side. And the reality is that the science is far from clear and far from dis uh, demonstrating the claims that people make about safety. And right here in Kauai, there was a, a commission, a bipartisan, no, it wasn't called bipartisan, what was it called? It was a called... Oh, the, the Joint Fact-Finding Commission? The Joint Fact-Finding Commission yeah. to, to deal with that. And that was supposed to kind of address the science part. And yet that seemed to not quite satisfy um, at the end of the day. Um, well, it's a very polarized issue. And if any group of people with any credentials regardless of what they are, comes out with a position for or against either side on this particular issue. In my experience, the other side will simply say uh, they're biased. Um, with the joint fact-finding uh, study, I thought under the circumstances they did a very good job. And I don't think that they overreached in terms of the conclusions that they made, most, most of which uh, had to do with the reality that there's insufficient testing and monitoring to allow uh, anybody to come up with the data that would prove or disprove a lot of the claims that are being made. But the industry approach was to say, oh, that's all nonsense, uh, it's anti-science. You know, the science shows there's nothing to worry about. The sad thing is that you expect that from industry, but when I hear that sort of thing coming from the Department of Agriculture, uh, or any other state entity, that concerns me because that demonstrates to me uh, that they have taken a political stance to defend the industry and they are not really open to another perspective and more important, their job being in the government is to protect the public interest, which includes a great deal more than the economic interests of multinational corporations who happen to be doing business in Hawaii. Right now, how is this playing out on the ground in the neighborhoods on Kauai? Is there some kind of protection? Do we know what's going on? I mean, you said that there's not much testing being done. So what is being done? Well, from my point of view, they're, they're, what's being done is inadequate. Certainly, there there is some uh, I mean, you, when, before you spray a pesticide, there is a label which is more than just, you know, a few sentences. It's a, it's a lengthy document that describes when you can use a, a pesticide that EPA has to approve. And presumably, 
uh, the users of these pesticides have to comply with it. It is the law to comply with it. However, uh, for one reason or another, the, that label is not always complied with. Uh, you know, back a few months ago, um, about a, a dozen uh, Syngenta field workers were sent to the hospital because they walked onto a field that had been sprayed with uh, a pesticide known as chlorpyrifos. Um, this was over on Kauai um, about 20 hours before. And, mm. and they got sick and, and were taken to the hospital. Um, and the, the, you know, Syngenta's response was something along the lines of, well, uh, you're not supposed to do walk into that area for 24 hours, uh, and this was too early. Well, there's supposed to be signs and there's supposed to be warnings and all of this. The extent to which they complied with those requirements is under investigation right now by the EPA, um, and that report is presumably forthcoming. Um, but regardless, what it shows is that for whatever reason, um, things happen. And whether they're for good reasons, bad reasons, things happen. And we are talking about some very toxic chemicals uh, that if used improperly can cause se serious harm. So, you know, you talk about the west side of Kauai. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm working on right now is uh, about two months ago, we gave notice to ADC, the Agri Agribusiness Development Corporation, said, you know, you are discharging uh, millions of gallons a day of uh, polluted water through a canal system that goes all through West Kauai, 40 miles of open water canals that drain the agricultural fields out there, uh, and it goes right into the beach. Okay, so we're talking Which about- Which beach? There are a number of beaches all along the west side of Kauai near Kakaha and Waimea. Uh, you've got millions of gallons a day of dirty water, and it goes through the town, and there are a variety of pollutants, including pesticides and other pollutants that are known to be in this water. And they are, they used to have a permit under the Clean Water Act that allowed them to discharge subject to certain restrictions. They're no longer doing that. They no longer have a permit and the Department of Health uh, is allowing them to do that. And it says, oh, you don't need a permit. We believe that that violates the Clean Water Act, and we told them unless they get a permit, we're going to sue them. So the agricultural, de uh, isn't that part of UH? Agri Agribusiness Development Corporation is a state agency that is uh, associated with the Department of Agriculture. And they are responsible, f They one of the things they do is they manage you know, thousands of acres of agricultural land, and they're responsible for developing agriculture in the state. So at some point they needed a permit to do this, but now somehow they think they don't. Right. Right. We have a difference of opinion. It'll be up well, to a judge. Whether there's a permit or not, I would certainly like to see some action taken besides getting a piece of paper that says you can do this. Is there some way of... Well, the paper wouldn't just say you can do this. The paper would say you can do this subject to certain restrictions that say how much of each pollutant you can allow, you have to test regularly, uh, and you have to report those test results every, uh, regularly, and those test results are public record, so anybody who wants to see them knows what's in the water. And if there's an exceedance of some uh, pollutant, uh, they can be subject to penalties. So it is regulated, and there are many of these permits, they're known as NPDES permits, uh, around the country. That is how our Clean Water Act works when pollution is discharged into water bodies. And for years, ADC did have such a permit, but then it decided that uh, it didn't need one. Mm, um, do you, is there any reason to believe that they are taking the steps necessary to, to test the water and make sure that it's safe uh, as, as it's being discharged? Without the permit? Uh, Do we I, know? I, I don't know. Clearly, to my knowledge, they have no, under their view, they have no legal responsibility to do so. Whether they're voluntarily doing it, what they're testing for, how they're doing it, I wouldn't know. All I know is that you know, they claim not to have that, that legal duty. Wow, well this is an upsetting little surprise, I must say. <laughs>
Uh, I think we'll have to do a little follow-up on this one. Wow, that is, those are some really large numbers that you um, put out there as far as how much water we're talking about going right out into the ocean. Right. Yeah. And it's essentially untreated. It's, I mean, if you go over to that area, you will pass big muddy ditches uh, mile after mile that just discharges into right, out, right into the beach. And this is runoff from actively um, uh, worked agricultural fields where there are chemicals being applied? It includes water from that, and it, 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 it drains a large area that includes active agricultural fields, also includes fields that are not in agricultural use. Uh, there are various uh, industrial uses um, and a variety of pollutants uh, that end up in this ditch system. Hmm. Well, Paul, we've got two minutes left, and we okay. were going to talk about the Dark Act. I don't know. Okay. If, if, do you have anything you can say about oh. that in two, two minutes? That sure, I, I can try. Uh, <laughs> okay. So what you're referring to is uh, a bill that is on President Obama's desk uh, that has passed the House and the Senate, which uh, requires labeling of foods that have some genetically engineered uh, ingredients um, and, it, and it's designed uh, essentially by the industry, the, 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 the food processing industry, to preempt a Vermont law that was passed requiring uh, labeling of genetically engineered foods. So that they wouldn't have to comply with that, they pushed a, a bill that provides for labeling nationwide, but it's extraordinarily inadequate. Uh, instead of saying, you know, this contains genetically engineered ingredients, which is what anybody would expect, right. um, it has a, a QR code, which is that little uh, sort of square um, icon that you may see on certain things that has to be scanned with a smartphone in order for you to have any idea what that QR code even means. There's no explanation. It doesn't say anything about genetically engineered ingredients. It just has a code. If you don't have a smartphone or you don't know what to do with that code, um, it's of no value to you at all. And there are 64% of Americans who don't even have a smartphone. Ah. Paul, thank you so much for coming here today to talk on Hawaii is my mainland, and thank you so much for the work that you and Earth Justice are doing to protect us. Thanks for inviting me.